Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Loveridge, for the wonderful introduction and for the great job you're doing and the great leader that you are. And you've been a great, great uh, partner uh, in helping us with our problems. So thank you very much. Let's get a big hand for Mayor Loveridge. <laughs> you have also here another pal, Senator Dutton. It's nice to see you here. And thank you also for your great leadership and for working so hard in Sacramento and helping us solve this budget crisis. A big hand also to Senator Dutton. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of mayors here and a lot of elected officials and local leaders and so on, and I think this is the idea uh, to get together. And I'm traveling up and down the state because this is the budget time. This is where everyone is talking about the budget. Everyone is talking about cuts. And budget is a very interesting thing. I mean, it's like it, someone once said that balancing a budget is like going to heaven. Everyone wants to do it, but no one wants to do what it takes to get there. <laughs> you see? So this is the big problem. Now, the budget problem, as the mayor said, there's other states, there's many states. More than half of the states <clears throat> in the United States have the same problem. You know, they go through a budget crisis, they're short on revenues and all of those things. And this is not the first time that this happened. It happens basically every five years or so. And since I've come to this country 40 years ago, I've seen it happen five times already in, in, in California and in the United States. And uh, so, but you say to yourself, why is it that we are not doing anything about it? That's my question. Why are we not doing anything about it? We know that there are times when the economy goes up and there are times when the economy comes down. It's the old saying, what goes up must come down. And we also know when the economy goes down, there's less revenues coming in. We know that. No surprise, nothing unusual. We know it. We knew last year when we started negotiating the budget that this year is going to be less uh, in revenues. And we knew that by the next year, meaning budget year 2008, 2009, it will be even worse. We knew that. But the problem is that the legislators in Sacramento – hasn't really dealt with that problem. No other states have dealt with that problem. So what we are recommending here is, is let us sit down one time with the Democrats and the Republicans and let's reform the system. And so what I have recommended when we got into this trouble, I said there's three things that we need to do. One is we have to make mid-year cuts. That means that we are declare a fiscal emergency, which was on January 10th to declare the fiscal emergency on the Proposition 58 where the legislators then have to come up and make cuts, mid-year cuts, because we know right now the state of California is spending four to $600 million more a month than we are taking in. Think about it. Four to $600 million more we are spending a month uh, than we are taking in. So therefore, we had to make mid-year cuts. Now, the legislators, Democrats and Republicans alike, have done a great job. They came in a week early before the 45 days were over and they made the necessary mid-year cuts that we recommended. Now the second step is to make the cuts and to solve the budget problem for the next fiscal year, which is 2008-2009. And that's what they will be working on very soon. As soon as they come back from the Easter vacation, the legislators have promised me they will get together and they will start negotiating on that. And then when, they, when we have done that, and of course, this coming year accumulated is around $14.5 billion deficit. So there's a lot of things to work on in order to solve that problem. And this is why we recommended uh, my office, my budget director, Mike Ginest. Where's Mike Ginest? Right over here, Mike Ginest, stand up so they can see us. Our budget director, Mike Ginest. We recommended to make 10% cuts across the board. So we don't pick and choose what is our favorite and what is a Republican program and what is a Democratic program. We felt that we shouldn't get into that fight. We should just cut 10% across the board. Then the legislators are going to look at it and they're going to say, well, maybe we do have preferences. Maybe we put a little bit more money here, less money over here. That's perfectly fine because the, because the legislators are my partners. So we're going to sit down and, like I said, everything is on the table. There are many different ideas and recommendations that they have that they want to put on the table. I say everything is on the table. We're going to look at all of those things and we're going to negotiate. So we're going to solve the problem. One thing I can tell you, that the way they're working together in Sacramento, it's unlike 
in 2003 when I came into office. But Democrats and Republicans could not agree on anything. They couldn't get anything done. Now they're working together. There's a lot of great things they've accomplished together, and I know that they will also solve together this budget problem that we have. Now that's step number two, to solve next year's budget problem. Step number three is that we have to reform the system, and that is the most important thing. That's where my eyes are on the most. The reason is because I don't want this to ever happen again. We can solve this problem. The way we solve it is the basic problem that we have with our budget is that when our years are good and our revenues spike, like sometimes by 23%, like in 1999, they took all of that money and they spent it. They didn't put one single dollar aside for a rainy day fund. They spent it all. So then when the economy went down and the revenues went down, oops, then they started freaking out. They started getting frantic. What do we do? Well, the Republicans don't like to increase taxes, and the Democrats don't want to cut programs. So they couldn't come to an agreement, and they were frozen. And then all of a sudden, they started taking money from the pension funds money, from transportation money, and then from local government money, right? So they started stealing money from everywhere because they, it was the only way out. And so then the economy comes back. The economy, when I came into office, we started stimulating the economy by reforming workers' compensation and started creating again a positive uh, business environment in California. People started gaining confidence again. They started investing again. And the economy came back. And what did they do as soon as we had a surge in revenues again in 2005? Again, they wanted to spend all of that money. Now, even though we put $3 billion aside for one day's uh, spending, so they couldn't spend all of that money, but still, there was $5 billion in there they should have put aside and didn't. Again, Sacramento went on with the spending. So what we are proposing is, is instead of doing that, let's put a rainy day fund aside. Let's put the money aside for a rainy day fund so that when revenues level off, see, our revenues are not going down. A lot of people say our revenues are going down. They're not going down. We still have, an, a, a, even though everyone talks about the economic problems that we have, which we do have, but it doesn't mean that our revenue is going down. Our revenue is going up by 1% instead of 6% this year. So we are not in a kind of a disaster situation. So it's just that the spending formula is requiring us to increase spending by almost 8%, but our revenues are only increasing by 1%. So therefore, that's what creates the deficit. So what we have to do is we should now have money available from a rainy day fund that we can supplement our revenues and therefore don't have to make all of those cuts that we're making. I have only people say, why are you cutting funding for education? Why are you cutting uh, you know, funding for prisons and for law enforcement? Well, how can I go and fund all those things when I only have $96 billion? We have this year in revenues $96 billion. And the formulas tell us that we have to spend $101 billion. So I cannot go and spend that money. I cannot promise that money when it doesn't exist. And next year, our formulas require us to pay out and to fund $111 billion. And our revenues are going to be short of $100 billion. How can we afford that? It's no way. So people say, why do you do that? Don't you like education? No, I love education. I love our kids. I love the work that the teachers are doing, but that's all the money we have. So the problem is that we don't have a rainy day fund set aside to supplement our revenues so we can afford all those programs. Here is a perfect example. Look at this chart here. This is the last 10 years. The green line represents the revenues. The yellow line represents the spending. Those two lines are totally separate. They're not related to, at all to each other. But they should be. They should be. So it's totally out of whack. When you see the, rev the, the spending up here, that's a difference every year, $5 billion that we're spending more. And then I came into office right here. Then those two lines are together. The economy has improved. But then here we are now. It goes totally out of whack again, the yellow line, the spending. Even though the revenues are leveling off, our spending requires us to spend much more money. So this separation here is right there $11 billion. 
Now here I show you a chart so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. If for the last 10 years we would have had a rainy day fund put aside and we would have had budget reform 10 years ago, we would have the two lines come together. Not perfectly together. No one says it's going to be perfect, but we would only be off by two, three billion dollars rather than 14 billion dollar deficit. Now here you can see that what happens now, this is 11 billion dollars out of whack and it would stay out of whack year after year. We would have to spend 11 billion dollars more every year than we are taking in on revenues, but we don't have that money. If we reform this year and our legislators come to an agreement and they reform the system, look how the two lines will come together, the yellow line and the green line. That is what we want to accomplish. It's very simple, and this is what we have to work for. I think both the Democrats and the Republicans have to understand that this is what we need to do in order to really and end safe the day, and so we don't have, we don't get into this problem year after year after year. Every single year in Sacramento, we are talking about budgets, we are talking and fighting about the budget. It's a waste of time. We can do much better than that. Now, what has happened in the past is, as I say, they took money everywhere. And what we have done when I came into office is protect our various different programs so that it doesn't happen again. What we wanted to do is tighten that noose when I came into office, we started working on Proposition 42, so they can't steal money anymore from transportation. Then we passed uh, uh, Proposition 1A, which was, and the mayor is very happy, and I think all the local officials are here, and the mayors are very happy about that, because Proposition 1A means that we cannot take any more money from local government. We took billions of dollars from local government in the past, and billions of dollars from transportation. And it was unfair, because on, on the local level, what you guys are doing is where the action is. You're providing really important services. Sacramento so many times thinks that there is, Sacramento is California. But I always show them the map <laughs> that California is this huge land with all of these hundreds of cities and counties and everything that you have here. And then if you're lucky and if you have good eyesight, you will find this little dot on top that says Sacramento. So that's really California. So we have to pay attention, close attention to local government. And this is why I'm traveling around the state, up and down the state, to let you know what the picture looks like, what our financial situation looks like, and how we have to work together in order to solve that. You are very important in this whole thing, a very important partner in this whole thing, because you can help me. Because there's nothing that I've ever done in California that I've accomplished since I've become governor that was not with the help of the people. You can't do this alone. You can have ideas. I'm a person that is courageous. I don't care about the political fallouts and all of those kind of things when people say, well, this is risky to do. You know, don't do infrastructure. No one is interested. We went out there and we started fighting for infrastructure. And look what happened. People's minds turned around and all of a sudden they committed and they approved all the infrastructure bonds, $42 billion. So the people's help is absolutely important in this. If it's the Proposition 1A, if it was Proposition 42, if it was Proposition 58 and 57 to get the $50 billion recovery bond money, all of those things, it was with the people's help. Workers' compensation reform, all of this was done with the people's help. So I need your help to put the pressure on the legislators to let them know, no, no, don't just solve this year's problem and next year's problem, but solve the problem for good. Solve the problem and reform the system so we are forced to put a certain amount of money aside for our rainy day fund, which basically means that let's not go and spend all that money when we have an increase in revenues, but let's only spend an increase to spending of 5%, because there's no reason that we ever have to cut any program. Think about that. As you can see with the lines, revenues on the end always go up. They never go down. They always go up. So why are we having to cut any program? The only reason is because one year we spend too much, and the next year we don't have the money. We cannot follow up when there's an economic downturn. So that is the reason why. So with that, I want to open it up and uh, answer some of your questions, because I know there will be some here that have questions about all of this. So I'm more than happy to 
answer them. Do we have any questions? Yes, please. Bear Stearns, and I was just hoping that you could comment on the change to, to, to J.P. Chase and how that's going to affect monies for the state of California. Well, uh, Morgan, as you know, took over, so I think business will go on. And I'm very happy that the federal government was participating and it brought confidence. And I think you saw it on the stock market the day that the stock went up again, the Dow Jones by 200, 229 points by the time I left my house. It could have changed by now. It could be 400 points. I have no idea. But at that point, it was 229 points, and everyone talked about that people are feeling positive and there is, you know, confidence and all of those things. So I think it's, it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Yes, please. I think that uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans uh, leaders in both parties have expressed to me that they are very interested in not only solving the budget problem, but also to solve uh, the problem that our system does not work and to solve that once and for all. And I think that what it is in the end is will be negotiations. You know, I think that since I put everything on the table, they will be talking about coming up with a way of creating revenues. They will be talking about ways of making cuts and how can we protect education more and how can we protect prisons more and how can we protect law enforcement. There will be all of those debates that will be going on and they will be looking at the tax loopholes some of them that maybe make sense to look at again, like I've said, you know, I'm more than happy to look at all of those things uh, that make sense uh, because if something doesn't produce revenues for the state, then why should we keep those tax loopholes? Um, you know, but those that do produce revenues and jobs for the state, we should keep those. So, so I mean, one has to look at all of those things. But I have, I have an open mind, and I've said to everyone, you know, this is a partnership between all of us at the capital. Everyone that is in there, let's get to the table and let's talk about it as quickly as possible. The reason why I say as quickly as possible is because it is very important to understand for everyone that when we talk about cuts, you can't make cuts from one month to the next. You probably know this also on a local level. If we might want to make a cut, for instance, in prisons, and we want to lay off prison guards, it takes nine months to be able for the state to lay off prison guards. If you want to make cuts in education, like this year we are over-appropriating in education $1 billion. Now, why are we over-appropriating? We found out that we are over-appropriating $1.4 billion, so we took $400 million away, but no more than that. Why? Because they have already hired the teachers. They already have committed that money, the education system. So we can't take all of that money away. It would be too much. It's already much as it is, so, but we didn't want to take it all away because they already spent it. So again, we couldn't cut that. So this is why it is very and, and medical bills when it comes to health care. Very complicated because of federal laws. You can't just cut from one minute to the next. So there's uh, various different departments. And Mike Chines, the budget director, can tell you how complicated it is to make cuts. It takes sometimes three to six months in order to make cuts and for those cuts to take an effect. And therefore, we have to negotiate now, and that's why I've asked the legislators, Let's start this year not after the May revise. Let's start early so that we have time that to, when we make decisions to recognize the fact that it would take three months for the cuts to take effect so that in July 1 those cuts can take effect. Let's make those decisions early. That's why I'm for early uh, you know, uh, agreements and, and for us to get together as soon as possible. Yes. Well, I think that uh, the question is, do we see any effect on local government uh, revenues? I think when it comes to law enforcement, without any doubt. You know, but in other things, not, because like, we, we are protecting local, the locals uh, so the state does not take the money away again because of Proposition 1A. But there will be some, you know, and you all know, uh, you know, we are short, and you probably are short on revenues with sales tax and all of those things. I think the whole state can feel those things. So I think what we have to do is, and what I recommend to other cities is, to also look at that rainy day fund idea. Like I talked to Mayor Autry yesterday, I was in Fresno. He said to me, I don't have a problem like you have. 
And I said, why not? And he says, because we have a rainy day fund. We put that aside. And he says, it was a huge fight in my city, he said. People were upset about it because I cut the budget by 10%. And they said, we're going to start putting a rainy day fund aside. They were upset. He says, no one wants to give up anything. He said, of course. But he said, now they're happy because they have $20 million set aside for this kind of a situation, economic situation. So they're fine. So that's, I would recommend it for every city to do, and I recommend it for any state in the United States to do. We're going to make really a, a strong drive to get that done. Yes. I know. And you're doing a great job. Thank you, sir. Yes. And I know you were in Washington, D.C. three weeks ago fighting on our behalf. And um, a question on, we've got to, if we get more jobs, obviously it helps the downturn turn around faster. And I was just wondering what else was your team was doing to help with the job situation to keep us globally competitive. And, and I know we're mostly business people and we're there with you and we want to support you, sir. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for the question. I tell you, it is very important that when you see the economy behaving as it does, that you react very quickly as a state. And especially when you have the subprime mortgage crisis and when you have the housing slowdown. The sales of housing is, is coming to, you know, it's come to a halt. And therefore, the jobs to build homes has to have deteriorated. So we have gotten together, legislators and myself, and started really working on what can we do. And so what we're doing is we know that the people of California have approved $42 billion of infrastructure bonds to rebuild California over the next 10 years. So we said, well, let's look at that and pump out that money quicker. And let's not make it over a period of 10 years. Maybe we should make it over a period of eight years and get the job creation going as quickly as possible. So I've been going up and down the state for the last few weeks and uh, taking money and appropriating money and uh, you know, putting that money out there so we can create the jobs if it is for affordable housing, if it is for transportation, for all those various different things, and this $400 million here, $100 million there, $200 million there. So really to get that money out there in order for us to create jobs so those people that are not working right now in building homes can have jobs in, in, the, in the public sector. So that is the idea. And so that's one of the things. Now, when it comes to the subprime mortgage crisis, as you know, we got together with the lenders, and uh, there were uh, half of the lenders uh, agreed do not increase and to freeze the interest rate for people that cannot afford the increase in the interest rates. So that was very important also that has uh, helped us save, uh, you know, for people to stay in their homes. In November, it was around 12 or 13,000 homes. In, G in December, it was around 9,000 homes. In January, it went up to 11,500. I think potentially it would save around 100,000 families so they can stay in their homes. So those are the kind of things that we do in order to counter what is going on out there. Yes, please. Well, as you know, law enforcement uh, has been cut exactly like everything else by 10%, right across the board. So it's 10% in law enforcement, 10% in prisons, 10% in education, 10% in all of those things, health care, in everything else, all the programs. So when we say 10%, may I remind you, it's not always exactly 10%. It could be 9.7% or it could be another one, could be 10.4% or so because it doesn't always work out that way. But it's a, the idea is to cut across the board 10%. And like I said, the legislators are going to get together uh, and Bob can talk about that, uh, the, what, what uh, happens, they get together and they start, you know, looking for their priorities. And uh, they will say, you know, we want to really protect more this area or that area. So that will be a debate that will be going on amongst the, the legislators. Yes? What can the business community do? I think the most important thing is for the business community is to be positive. And to look at that, not, not like so many times when you talk to people, to look at the economic situation and say, oh, my God, the economy is doing terrible. And this. That's not the attitude, because we know, as I said earlier, that the economy goes up and down all the time. So this is going to go away. The key thing for you always is to be positive, to continue doing business, to continue having a positive outlook, even though it's harder to get loans, even though it's, it's harder to make sales. Yes, it is more difficult and more challenging. But, you know, that's not, uh, you know, what defines us. What defines us really is, is when we can do well when times are tough. Anyone can do well when times are going well, when times are uh, great. 
and when things are going well, <coughs> that's, that's easy. But, you know, it's like in sports. I learned in sports there were times when I laid down on that bench press. And I just, there was 500 pounds on it. And I tried it, and I couldn't do it. And I tried it again the next day, and I couldn't do it. And I went back and back until I did it. And this gives you the lesson that teaches you a lesson that you never give up. You never give up. There are times when I walked into the gymnasium where I was tired from the last days working out. But I, I pushed my way through it and I pushed my way through it and pushed. And that's why I became the youngest world champion in bodybuilding. Because I never gave up. I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and I pushed through the most difficult moments. And that is what it is in life. In sports, you learn all the lessons that are important for life. Because that's the way it is in life. With relationships, it's like this. There are moments where it's down, but you cannot give up. You've got to push through it. In business, you've got to push through it and be positive. Get up in the morning and say, isn't it great that we are in America? I mean, think about that. Isn't it great? I mean, me as an, as an immigrant, I wake up every morning and I just say, thank God, I'm in America. That is fantastic. I'm in America. So, so you know, the, 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 in, the, in, and in America, there's sometimes the times are tough and sometimes they're great. And so, you know, we have to find a way to push through it. Maybe I have a question right here. Do we have a mic for the lady? I mean, are you guys asleep today? What happened, what happened with the efficiency factor? You're fired. I commend you. I commend no, no, no. you for... Give me the coffee first and you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I commend you for understanding the infrastructure situation that we're in, that we really do need to get people back to work, and that would be a great way to stimulate. Um, my only um, thing that I ask as a contractor is that we allow those funds to not be tied to any type of union contracts. I'm an open shop contractor, as Riverside most of us are, and I, um, I think in order for the whole economy to be able to be stimulated, we all have to have the opportunity to work. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. And I think the important thing is to get the people like you, independent contractors and others, to get them, uh, you know, the jobs and to get them the, the kind of, you know, the contracts so that you can continue on. And this is what it's all about. And that's why I want to create the public-private partnerships also because that's where the real action is because I said always – that our $42 billion in infrastructure bonds that the people have agreed to um, is only the, the, the foot in the door. But really what the, California, what the state of California needs is $500 billion in infrastructure over the next 20 years. That is what we need. That's the reality of it because we are so far behind in everything because we have not built anything in the last 40 years. We have not kept up with our levies to fix our levies, with the prisons, uh, with the schools, university system, transportation, mass transit, all of those things that are falling behind. And now we are in the middle of negotiating for water to uh, really redo our water infrastructure because in California that has fallen behind 40 years. Our water infrastructure right now is for 18 million people, and we need it for not only the 38 million that we are now, but for 50 million because by the time the project is finished, we will be 50 million people. So this is, we have to face reality, we have to do the infrastructure, and this is why I said, I have a big vision, and I go in there and I push the legislators to go in that direction, to rebuild California, to invest in the future of California, in all of those areas. And I have to say that they've done a great job until now because they've agreed to the infrastructure in transportation, they've agreed to the infrastructure in uh, schools, affordable housing, mass transit, all of those areas and even educational, career-tech educational facilities, which is something that I am a big believer in, career-tech education. And now we have to go beyond that, and we have to agree to a public-private partnership so that companies like you, all of those companies, can participate in rebuilding California. That is the idea. Yes. I'm glad to hear you talk about the flexibility of your new project Here's a microphone for you. I think it's naive to think that because uh, in California education does take such a large part of the budget that it won't be cut. But can we look at flexibility and how those are spent because so much of it is categorically funded that if there's more flexibility, then K-12 and K-14 and the other institutions would have an, a better control and ability to best serve all our constituencies. Any thoughts on that? 
Well, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that was recommended in our education studies that were done over the last three years is that we have to go and give local control. You know, because I think that Sacramento is still, you know, too much in control of education. And I think that if we let the locals control more their, their, their school systems and local districts control their school districts as long as they do well, I think that's a much uh, less expensive way of going and also gives everyone the freedom because there is no glove, one glove fits all. You know, because every area is so different. The challenges are different of who you have in the school, who the kids are, who the families are, and all of those things. So I totally agree, and I think everyone agrees with that. And that's one of the things that we have to work on, even though we don't have the money to do the full education reform that we intended because of the economic slowdown. But uh, there's a lot of things that we can do, like we have just done 97 of the most uh, problem, uh, problematic school districts. We have just, you know, now worked with them and worked other way to bring them up to standard and funding the $45 million of federal funds under the No Child Left Behind Act and so on. So there's a lot of things that we're doing, but we've got to go and, and really give the locals more control over their schools. Yes. Microphone. All right. Get right over here. If you give it to the gentleman. Thank you. Governor, we're really happy to have you here in Riverside. As you know, uh, Riverside and San Bernardino counties have come together and are working together on an economic development plan called the Green Valley Initiative. The objective of Green Valley Initiative to, is to attract green and clean technology jobs to the Inland Empire in order to deal with our imbalance of jobs and people which is really the root of many of our problems here in the Inland Empire. So we wanted to hear, I, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the uh, potential of attracting these clean and green technology, higher paying jobs to the Inland Empire? I think it is uh, very good, and I want to commend you on always talking about the environment, while also you're talking about economic stimulation and about, you know, making your business grow. And I think this is what it is all about. And when I came into office, I remember when I was campaigning for governor in 2003, people thought that it wasn't possible. They said, you know, this guy is always talking about, you know, that we have to protect the economy and we have to protect the environment. How do you do both? Well, we can do both. And we have seen it now over the last four years that you can do both, that you can have economic stimulation. And we have seen with green, clean technology that you're talking about, there's $2 billion this, uh, this year that came into California on the venture capital. That's an increase of 50% over last year. I mean, green, clean technology is booming in California. It is huge. It has been a huge success. And there's more and more companies that are coming here because we set serious caps. This cap and trade with Proposition 40, uh, I mean, with uh, AB 32, we made a decision to roll back our greenhouse gases to the 1990 level by the year 2020, which is a 25% reduction, and then another 85% by the year 2050. So now people know that this is serious, and that's why businesses are coming in and now creating that technology, because the only way we can achieve those goals is through technology. I mean, you can also through conservation and not use as much energy and as much water and all of those things, which is also a wise way to go, but an addition to that technology is going to save us all. The same is with the cars. We should not stop driving cars, but we should have cars that, have, that are electric-driven, that are with biofuel and so on, rather than to have this fossil fuel that creates all this pollution. So this way technology will save us, and it's a huge industry. As a matter of fact, the Wall Street Journal just recently said it's a whole new gold rush for California because there's so much money coming into our state and uh, green, clean technology. Yes. Governor, thank you very much for paying attention uh, to, the, to Riverside. We appreciate your visit. My question has to do with the budget. Uh, could you share with us your thoughts on a two-year budget cycle, the merits of that? As most of us know, the uh, budget process goes for six months, and then uh, we're halfway into the next year when we have to start all over again. I think that uh, Mike Janess can tell you that we have been talking about a two-year cycle for a long time, and I think it's a good, a, a, a good idea. And I think this is another thing that we are going to bring up this year is talking about that because it's a better way. There's many, many states that do that, and they're much better off when you project two years into the future because things change all the time, and you can make much better decisions this way. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, we take one more over here. Please. There's a microphone right here. My perspective is in higher education and the CSU in particular. And we, of course, see ourselves, as I'm sure many do, as a part of the solution. Um, in that, say, for instance, in, in the business area, we graduate 65% of the people who are going to be going into business uh, with a degree in higher education in the state. My concern is that our targets now are having to stabilize. So my question is really very related in that what do you see as the duration of the cycle that we're currently in, um, and particularly that 10% cut? How is that going to change over the next year or two or three so that we can have that positive feeling about still being a part of the solution for the very near future? I would look at it as a bump in the road. That's what it is. Because when we reform, which means that this year we have a problem because we have to make the cuts. But in an ongoing way, if we solve our budget problem and if we solve our budget system and reform it, then we will have an increase of 5 to 6% every year for higher education, for kindergarten through 12th grade, for community colleges, for law enforcement, for prisons, for everything. There will be no more problem. There will never be, there never should be a time where we make any cuts to higher education or to any other education as far as it goes. It is only because our system is flawed, and therefore we don't have enough rainy day money put aside so we can supplement our revenues this year uh, because our revenues are down. So that is really the problem. This is, it goes back here again. As you can see, the revenues are keep going up and up and up. There's no reason to make any cuts. Let's bring those two lines together, the spending and the revenue lines. Let's bring them together, and then let's have an increase of funding for all of those programs by 5 to 6%, and the rest of the money, when we have a surge in revenues, we put aside for the rainy day fund. Okay? So I have great hopes for higher education in California, and I have to say you are part of a, a winner because anywhere that I go in the world, they admire the California university system. We have the best university system in the world. There is nothing that comes even close to it. And for you to be part of that, so you should be proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we take – well, I'm getting the signal back there. I'll give one more question right over here, please. <clears throat> Governor, you once had a vision of uh, redistricting. Do you believe that had we been able to create a more centrist uh, legislature that we might not be in this uh, fiscal problem? You know, it could be, it could not be. But let me address just redistricting because we have a ballot right now. We have a uh, – we're gathering signatures right now for redistricting to put it on a ballot in November because I think – and I'm a big believer – that redistricting will solve a lot of the problems. What you see in Sacramento is what you see also in Washington. The Democrats and Republicans are so far apart. And the reason why they, the, 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 the Democrats are so far to the left and Republicans are so far to the right, and then to get to the center where you can come to an agreement is very tough to do. And the, the, the reason is because the way the districts have been laid out and designed and drawn. I mean, the Democrats are all locked into their Democratic districts, Republicans, and their Republican districts. So when there's an election and you go through the primaries, after that you know who is the winner. They don't have to spend a, a dime. I have had so many times politicians come to me and say, I only spent $800 for my election. I say, $800? Why? This could be this is impossible. They say, well, because there was no one there. Who is going to beat me? <laughs> so this is why out of 496 seats... They changed hands this last uh, three election cycles. Only four, only four really changed parties. Think about that. Only four changed party hands. Out of uh, 496 that were available, only four changed party hands. Now, people complain in America about how set up the system is with Putin in Russia. They say, well, they, I think that guy knows ahead of time if he's going to win. Well, what, do you think, what do you think is going to happen in California? <laughs> they know ahead of time who is going to win, too. Out of, out of 496, only four changed hands, political hands. I mean, that is rigged. The system is rigged. 
And what happens is that there is no competition between Democrats and Republicans. So we have to draw the district line so we make a line through it so that we have Democrats and Republicans in the district. So there's competition, so you have a choice. You can say, you know, this guy has a better answer for the future of California than this guy. To me, the redistricting has nothing to do with that we want to get more Democratic seats or more Republican seats. That's just bogus talk. Redistricting is all about to get people to compete and to campaign and to be more in the center. That brings then Republicans that will win in a Republican in a district. They have to be more in the center, and the Democrats have to come more in the center. So now when they go to Sacramento, it's easier to get together and to come to an agreement. And more things, more problems will be solved. So that is the idea. Let's make it fair and let's create real democracy. So, again, I will need all of your help. I'm glad that you brought it up. Someone is going to walk around with a hat and is going to collect cash, okay, so we, so we pay for the signature gathering. So, anyway, thank you very much, all of you, for, the, for participating. Thank you.